Welcome to How to Talk to Kids About Anything with Dr. Robin Silverman, a podcast loaded with practical tips, powerful scripts, personal stories, and simple steps to make even the toughest conversations easier. So get ready to get the information you need to make the impact you want from someone you trust, your friend, parenting expert, Dr. Robin Silverman. Hello and welcome to How to Talk to Kids About Anything, where we give you the tips, scripts, stories, and steps to make even the toughest conversations easier. I'm so honored to be your host, Dr. Robin Silverman, Child and Teen Development Specialist, author, and speaker, and most importantly, parent of two great kids who give me the opportunity to love, learn, and grow every single day, whether I want to or not. Believe me, I get it. It's not always easy. But we're in this together, and we have some great people helping us along the way. Inspiring kids today to become tomorrow's leaders can often feel like venturing into a whole new world. Things are definitely different from when we were kids. Remember when we used to sit in rows in classrooms, listen to our teachers, do our worksheets, play in the streets, talk on the phone? So much has changed. This generation's attitudes are different, their methods of communication are different, their attention span seems different, and they can multitask on several different screens at the same time. Understanding and connecting with this generation can often feel frustrating, confusing, and even draining to parents and teachers as we want our young people to venture outward, work hard, and stand on their own two feet, but find that old methods aren't always working. We need new strategies to lead this new generation. Dr. Tim Elmore is a best-selling author and CEO of Growing Leaders, a global nonprofit organization created to empower students with real-life leadership skills. Tim's experience on the emerging generation has led to media coverage in the Huffington Post, the Wall Street Journal, Forbes.com, USA Today, and the Washington Post. He's also appeared on CNN's Headline News and Fox & Friends to discuss how to lead millennials in Generation Z. Tim's latest books, include Marching Off the Map, Inspire Students to Navigate a Brand New World, and 12 Huge Mistakes Parents Can Avoid. I am so excited to have Dr. Elmore on the show, so please join me in welcoming Dr. Tim Elmore to How to Talk to Kids About Anything. Welcome. Thanks, Robin. Great to be with you. Great to have you, too. So before we get into the meat of the matter, for those who haven't had the opportunity to read your books or to see you speak, can you tell us what gets you up in the morning and how you got so interested in helping to prepare kids to become leaders in a changing world? (laughs) That's a great question. It's a loaded question, Robin. Um, I'll give you the Reader's Digest version. Yeah, just in three words. No, I'm just kidding. Okay, there you go. I started teaching students in 1979, so it was the late baby boomers, if you remember at that point, coming through high school and college. Um, And then, of course, I saw Gen X, I saw the millennials, and now Generation Z. Over that period of time, I saw parenting styles changing radically, Mm. uh, where, and if I can put, I I know it's not good to, uh, to, to... simplify this too much but i felt like we began to care more about protecting than preparing Mm -hmm, kids mm -hmm. there's nothing wrong with protecting but boy when we do that almost to the exclusion of i'm getting you ready for the adult world that you're about to enter into and spend the most of your life in right um troubled me so even though i was teaching and leading students i thought boy we've got to We've got to begin working with the, the adult, the teacher, the parent, the coach, the employer who is going to be part of the raising of that child and developing that child. So I, be, I found myself using statements like, you're not raising a child, you're raising a future adult. Mm-hmm. You're not teaching a kid, you're teaching a, a, a future citizen. You know, those kinds of almost cliches, but it began to ring true and, and be it got traction, as you have seen, Robin, because we adults just got scared when we began to see maybe what we're doing isn't fully working and they're not quite ready when they turn 22 and they enter perhaps the very first full-time job they've ever had. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of what gets you up in the morning is getting this generation ready to not just survive uh, their adult life, but to really thrive when they get done with school. Love it. And I think what you're hitting on is extremely important. We know the world has changed and this can be disconcerting and frustrating and confusing for parents and teachers. In reading your books, you talk about the fact that 
we can't keep applying the same methods we have in the past to lead this new generation. You talk about the new realities that we need to keep in mind if we want to inspire young people to navigate this new world. And you talk about your own experience that it has taught you that adults have to balance two realities while leading the next generation. So I want to know what are these two new realities and, and how can they help us to navigate the world of this constant changing and connectivity that our kids are growing up in? Great question. I would say the two realities that I like to write about for the adult, for the leader of the, of the, of the student, is um, these two components that I'm going to call responsive and demanding. Now, in just a minute, Robin, I want to give you two that I think the kids need to balance. But when I lead my children, when I teach my students, I've got they need me to be responsive uh, at once uh, on the one hand, meaning I get you. Mm -hmm. I believe. You. I support you. I'm attentive to you. You don't have to wonder about my belief in you. So that's the responsive part. And, and, and every kid in America, would that every child in America get that from a caring adult? But I think many middle class and certainly affluent families would say, well, they got that. I'm responding all the time, taking them to karate and soccer practice and everything else. They also need us to be demanding, which means not that I stop responding or I stop loving you, but because I believe in you, I'm going to hold you to a standard that I'm sure you're capable of meeting. Uh, so very few of us as human beings, particularly young human beings, rise to a standard without someone challenging us to, to meet that standard, to, to, to reach that, that potential that we have. So in any given day when I'm in front of my children, I'm asking, do they need responsiveness from me or demandingness from me? Uh, so let me give you an illustration. Mm -hmm. uh, my kids are now older adults. Bethany is 30 and Jonathan's 26. But when they were young people, I tried to find a way to apply responsive and demanding all the time. So when my son Jonathan got his driver's license at 16 years old, he didn't get a car right away. Um, he had to save his money, and we went half and half on a previously owned automobile. So that was the responsive and demanding. I'm going to help, but I'm not going to get it for you. Mm. I'm saying that's what you have to do. I'm just saying that was one way we applied the responsive and demanding. Now, prior to getting the car, he had to borrow the family car, you know, to go out on a Friday night with his friends. So if he said to me, Dad, can I borrow the family car to, you know, go out with Ben? Uh, if I threw him the car keys and let him use the car – I was being responsive. I think you would agree with that. That's I, right. I, to his request. But I would say, here's the keys. Fill up the tank with gas. And he'd go, oh, my gosh, fill up the tank with gas. That's so You know, I can't believe you made me do you know. <laughs> and I would say, or you can make a car payment. Either one. It's up to you, you know. And he would always roll his eyes, and we would start laughing together because he's heard me say this, responsive and demanding. I'm going to be responsive to you, but I'm also just giving you a freebie tonight doesn't get you ready for the way the adult world works. Mm. And filling up the tank with gas is not even near what a car payment's going to be. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, one more quick thing before you volley back. I think we need to make sure that the kids under our care are balancing two realities, autonomy and responsibility. I think whenever a child gets a level of autonomy, which means I get to be independent, I get to do it my way, I get to do it without the help of a grown-up, they need to have an equal but opposite dose of responsibility. So if I – let me just put it bluntly. If a child growing up in America has all kinds of autonomy but no responsibility, we create brats. Mm. And I don't think we need any more brats in America. we got plenty. We're good. Uh, yes, we're good. We're good on that one. If they get all responsibility and no autonomy, we might have that stereotypical kid that's hovering over mama's apron strings as a homeschool kid or whatever. You, you know what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. and he or she needs to try it out. Go for it. Step out of the house. You know, that sort of thing. So let's go back to my illustration. So if my son Jonathan wants to go out with the family car, giving him car keys gives him auton autonomy. Fill him tank, the tank with gas gives him responsibility. I don't mean to oversimplify, but I'm telling you, those two components saved my hind end as I thought through, as my wife and I thought through, how do we lead our kids into knowing how the world works, but in a level that fits them at 12, 15, 17, 8, uh, you name it. So 
I'll okay. Stop here. Well, I'll say that let's if we can bring the example down now, since we were just did a teen example. If we yeah. looked at a little bit younger, the child who was just given the opportunity to either get online or to yeah. use an iPad or to now they're allowed to use you know, kids YouTube or something new. They just got a new game on, you know, they're able to do something you haven't done online. So how would you use your same responsive, demanding autonomy, responsibility uh, idea to this younger child who's given this new uh, privilege yeah. Yeah. Of, of, yeah. of doing something online? Okay. Here's one way it might look. So let's say they have the iPad or they're on the computer or they're six years old or whatever they are. I would say getting on is obviously a level of autonomy that they've not had to this point. I would make sure as a parent, let's say, we're talking about that context, I would make sure I get an app and there's a number of apps available that I can track what they have been doing online, mm -hmm. okay? And so I tell them, Josh, Jessica, or whoever, um, I'm, I'm gonna allow you to be on for two hours, okay? So after school, blah, blah, blah. You have two hours. I don't necessarily say I can track that, but I know I can. And at the end of the day, I might say as I'm tucking them into bed, hey, I noticed you were online two and a half hours. And I and I I told you two hours and they suddenly realized, OMG, mm. um, knows, you know, this the phrase we always use in our house. And we said it a different way based on their maturation was relationships operate on the basis of trust. If we feel like we can trust you, you're going to get all kinds of freedom. But if we don't feel like we can trust you, you're going to feel like you're not getting freedom. But you earn every level of autonomy. And Bethany and Jonathan both knew that. Now, did they like it? Not necessarily. Mm -hmm. But this is now the good news is as soon as they were done with college, both of them immediately got jobs because they knew how life works. So that would be perhaps that mm -hmm. I can track. Do, I give them the boundaries and I see if they're able to follow those boundaries. You know, here's another scenario, um, Robin. Let's say you're letting them go outside and play with friends without any adult supervision. Mm -hmm. okay, that's a hard one for mamas today sometimes. Well, I give them a boundary geographically and I make sure that um, let's say they've got that portable device and I can track. Are they doing it or are they not? And the more I trust them, uh, and that's built through the tracking, the more I'm able to say, Josh, you've been so good with this. I'm going to let you stay out a little bit longer. You've earned it. And he begins to know, wow, I, I earned this. I sure, certainly don't want to lose this trust. So I'm going to make sure that I keep this perk, you know, that sort mm -hmm. of thing. Right. Okay. And in that same way, if we are telling our child, yes, you may use this technology device, but first I need you to finish your homework and your chores or whatever it is that they need to do, that would also give them the opportunity to show responsibility as well as have the opportunity to be autonomous. Absolutely. In fact, I'm glad you brought that up. That's a totally different scenario. I think that's such a great uh, way to do it, and here's why. I believe um, a home and for that matter, a school runs best with very few rules, lots of equations. Very few rules, lots of equations. Here's the difference. In our house growing up, our kids had very few rules. I think we had three total rules mm -hmm. in our whole house. And one was about loving people, loving each other, loving people. Um, an equation is very different. No kid likes rules, at least that I know of. But equations are different. Uh, equ an equation is, well, honey, if you do this – that's the benefit mm -hmm. that this is the consequence. And they realize an equation is a give and a take. There's a there's a response. There's a benefit or a consequence to every behavior. And the reason that's important, Robin, to me, in my opinion, my humble opinion, is that's how life works. Mm -hmm. Adults know if I don't pay my rent, I don't keep the apartment if I don't pay my mortgage. So it's an equation. And the bank doesn't even have to yell at us. They just take the house away. <laughs> <laughs> All we're doing, we're getting them used to how life works, but on a level uh, where the stakes are lower. It's not the end of the world if they miss it, but they start seeing how, how life works. So, yes, if you say do your homework and once you're done, they start realizing I got to you know, pay now, play later. And, and they start realizing that's the way I probably need to live my life. I can discipline myself so somebody else doesn't have to. 
Excellent, excellent. I really understand what you're saying, and that makes a lot of sense to me. We all know that this is hard for people. You know, there's, um, you know, people don't like change. We know that this is uh, from our own experiences. We know that change can be hard, and I think it can be. You know, from what you're talking about in, in, in our world, it can be the uncertainty. It can be a desire for our young children to look great on paper. It could be a hope for some kind of control that we want to still have on our kids. Some way to rig the system so our children succeed or get a leg up. That can have an impact on us. And it can lead us as parents and educators to sometimes make some pretty big mistakes when we're parenting or working with children. And in one of your recent books, you talk about 12 huge mistakes we make when we're leading kids to succeed in life. And, uh, you know, I know that you're, you definitely don't want them to just look good on paper because that's not going to do it. So what are some of these top mistakes that we need to avoid and what should we be doing instead? Okay, great question, Robin. I would say when I did that book, 12 Huge Mistakes Parents Can Avoid, all 12 of those common, common mistakes that I saw from New York to California, I mean, it's not just one state or three states, we're all making these common, common errors, including me. Mm -hmm. I, sure. <laughs> well, yeah, the 12 mistakes all fall under four major categories. So I'll just toss them out and then we can camp out wherever you want to. Here they are. We risk too little. We rescue too quickly. We rave too easily. And we reward too frequently. Mm -hmm. Now, all of those are well-intentioned. Uh, when I did them, they were all well-intentioned. But I started seeing the data that that this was leading to a, 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 a bad track record. Something something negative would happen when I when I raved too quickly or too easily, and it led to them expecting some things that that weren't going to happen. You know that sort of thing. So the risk in the rescuing. Now, this has all happened in a new generation of parents where we did, like you just said, want to have them look good on paper. They got the full pino. They, they got the great um, extracurricular activities all listed on the transcript. And yet they really weren't ready for interacting with, you know, colleges or high schools or whatever. Or we did their homework for them or helped them too yeah. much or, yes, right. Robin, I have seen way too many parents when I walk into a Starbucks doing their child's homework for them. Mm, yeah, I've heard and when I asked, too. because some of my knew, I said, tell me what you're doing. They smiled sheepishly and said, well, he's so stressed out or he's so busy and he is busy, but I would say then he doesn't need to do 17 extra activities right now. Right. Right. I, all fun. But we, that we're, you probably think I'm crazy here, but we said to our children, one extra activity per season. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. all in the spring fall. Other kids were doing seven or eight, and Bethany would go, but my friends are all doing that. Well, you're not the Elmores. You know, we're, <laughs> this mm -hmm. is our family. Uh, but it gave us time around the dinner table. It gave us time for sanity where they could do better in school because they weren't racing to the next activity. So I'll stop there, and we can camp out on any one of those if you want to. Yeah. You know, it, we, we've talked in the past, we talked to Jessica Leahy on uh, failure and, and allowing children to fail. And we've talked, uh, we talked to KJ Delantonia, uh, recently about how we, all this, like, there's too many activities and we, it's okay to say no and, and kind of getting into that. But I, I do want to hear more about, uh, the, the raving too much and the rescuing. Uh, I do want to hear a little bit more about those and, and how that mistake is made and, and what we can do instead of that. Okay. We'll start with rave. Um, I am an affirmer of kids. Again, I, I love kids. It's what my job is. And I love my own two adult children now. But I noticed I was rave. I think I started raving with all the parents of millennials uh, way back in the 80s and 90s. Uh, I started seeing that the word awesome was probably overused. Oh, goodness. Right. Is awesome is really anything awesome. Does it require four exclamation points at the end of the text for it to have any meaning? You know, we're just in a day of hyperbole. Yes. So here's, here's the modification that I recommend, and it's based on research out of Stanford University. You probably are familiar with Carol Dweck. Oh, who love her. Love her. She's yes. fat. She did her research at Columbia University originally, 
and started, she started noticing that 85% of American parents believe it's important to tell your children they're smart. Mm -hmm. In fact, they go out the door in the morning, tell your child you're smart. Mm -hmm. And the reason we believe that is because we think it's going to give them a little angel on the shoulder when they're taking that pop quiz or that next exam. Carol Dweck saw those kids at school and knew it was backfiring. And here's what she did to find out if that was true. She divided uh, these children, I think they were 10 years old, so fifth grade, into two groups. She gave both of them a, a test that was equal in, in uh, rigor. When the tests were over, they didn't tell them the score, but to the first group, the kids were told, you must be smart. The second group was told, you must have really tried hard. Mm -hmm. Now, can you see the difference? One was for effort, one was for smarts. Right. A second round of tests were given. This one was much harder. And they even said, kids, this is really much harder. You don't have to take it if you don't want to. Do you want to? Almost none of the kids in the first group actually wanted to take the test. Mm -hmm. Even though they'd just been told they were smart. And Carol Dweck said, she found out later as they debriefed with the kids after the experiment, the kids were basically going, you just told me I'm smart. I have a sneaking suspicion I'm not that smart, mm -hmm. so I'm going to stop right here where I'm ahead, you know, it, you know that sort of thing. I'm mm -hmm. not going to try another time because I might risk mm -hmm. finding out that I'm really not that smart. Now, in the second group that had been occur uh, affirmed for effort, which is repeatable, they, almost all of them, did want to take the test. Mm -hmm. And Carol said, even though none of them did really well because it was so much harder, it was like two grades harder, uh, she said that the kids kept coming back with this response. I love this test. This is my favorite test. They actually love the challenge of the test. Now, one last piece. When a third round of tests were given, back down to their level, the kids' appropriate age level, the kids in the first group actually did 30% worse. And when Carol and her team at Columbia were baffled, they found out by asking the kids the reason why. The kids basically said, well, if I'm so smart, I shouldn't have to try so hard. Mm. Makes sense. Right. So Carol began to say, we need to affirm variables that are in their control, not out of their control. Kids think, I'm either smart or I'm not. I'm either beautiful or I'm not. I'm either awesome or I'm not. You know, and, and Carol said, if you start saying, I love the strategy you used on that math problem, rather than you make an A, you're awesome. If you don't, you're not. Suddenly we have a, a kid that can repeat the effort because effort is repeatable. I'll stop there, but that's just a huge way mm -hmm. we change the encouragement of our kids. Make sure you're affirming something they can actually choose to do. Right. So I'll, I'm sorry. I'll just give you one more illustration. With my daughter, Bethany, I would constantly tell her how beautiful she was. I just thought dads ought to say that. And while I still said that, I gave way more words of affirmation on Bethany. I love the the compassion you show to your friends. Bethany, I love the strategy you used on that math problem last Tuesday. Mm -hmm. Bethany, I love the integrity you just showed la yeah, you know, yesterday in that ball game. So that's something she can hear dad say and go, you know what, I can do that again. So I, I found I was, I, was, I was cultivating a better human being out of my own daughter when I was affirming things she could repeat. Right, and it's generalizable so that they can take it from... I uh -huh. am doing this on this math. I'm using this interesting strategy on this math quiz, and that's being encouraged and praised. So I'm somebody who uses interesting strategies, and now I can use the same type of idea in a totally different area on the sports field or uh, with a friend. And I can learn that I'm somebody who thinks outside of the box and uses different strategies to solve problems. Absolutely. You're spot on. Yeah. All right. So let's get into this idea of rescuing and how that is a mistake that we need to avoid and what we should be doing instead. All right. So um, we have concluded with the research we have done that many parents in America, not all, but many parents in America have a narrative going on inside of them of fear for their children. Mm -hmm. My child's not going to make the honor roll. My child's not going to uh, make the football team. My child's not going to be first chair in violin or whatever it is. So we have this fear. thing. In fact, 
let's face it, we're afraid of school shootings. We're afraid of social media, cyber bullies. There's a lot to be afraid of. Most parents would agree there's a lot to be afraid of in the day we live in. Mm -hmm. So I believe that has led us to naturally think, well, I need to rescue my child then. If I can do something about them potentially failing at something or getting bullied or whatever, I want to come in and rescue. So in elementary school, this may start with us running their gym shorts down to the school when they forgot them mm -hmm. or in middle school bringing in that permission slip that they forgot to get you know fly. or in high school i'm now coming in to negotiate a grade with the teacher mm -hmm. you know that that i think should have been higher and i wish it was higher and so i i just noticed i don't know what you've seen robin but i just noticed the huge shift that took place between the time i was a kid and the time today's kids are kids when I got in trouble at school, I'd get home. My parents would find out I'd get in trouble a second time. You know? mm -hmm, sure. No, mom and dad. Are. Today, if a child gets in trouble, mom and dad find out. Oftentimes, they're not all the time, but often they're storming into the classroom. The teacher's in trouble. They're siding with their child oftentimes. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, mom and dad, you are collaborating adults with this teacher. Work with them to bring out the best. You know what? They may flunk a test in, in, during, the, during the course this year, but it will only happen once because if you join forces out of belief in this child rather than rescue them, and now they go, okay, good. Mom's my agent. She'll rescue me the next time. I, I, I just think we're, we've got to think long-term, not short-term in our parenting. Mm -hmm. um, funny, funny story. One boy's school, private school in Arkansas, Little Rock, Arkansas, uh, put a sign up in their lobby of the school with a smiley face, but it said, parents, if you're coming in to bring in your son's forgotten gym shorts, permission slip, you know, whatever, whatever, please turn around and exit the building <laughs> to problem solve in your absence. And I thought that is so good. Mm -hmm. We have removed perhaps their ability to be resourceful and resilient and actually problem solve because we've been solving the problems for them. Yes. So mom and dad, if you're listening, I would just say think twice before you run it down and uh, just say, is this really helping in the long run or is it a shortcut to a better day today? Not a better day tomorrow. I love that. I love that there are teachers that have been thinking this way. And in yeah. fact, my daughter, um, my daughter sometimes has some trouble with organization and leaving things at home or leaving things at school. And she had forgotten to bring something in several days in a row. And we've got, my daughter has two new, brand new, very excited teachers who are ready to rock and roll and put a, put a bracelet around her wrist to help her remember that she had been forgetting something so that she could do something at home to make sure she remembered the next time. So uh, she, she comes home with this bracelet and then they gave her also a blank piece of paper with this big like thought bubble on it. And she wrote on it in front of me. She said, I have to remember these things. She wrote the note and then put it on the door going outside to the garage that she goes through every single day in order to get to the bus. I was like, I mean, floored because I didn't have to do a thing. I didn't have to say anything. Yeah. She put it up there. She got it. Go you know, she put the thing, whatever it was, in her bag for the next day. And I haven't heard anything about it since then. So I agree with you. I like the idea. It is excruciatingly painful to watch yeah. somebody forget something and realize like an hour into school that the homework is on the table. And I, so I really understand the plight of the parent yeah. and feeling like, oh boy, like she worked on that. Now it's here, yeah. you know, and I'm not racing it to the school. But I've done that in the past where I, I haven't brought it in. And of course the teacher then says something to the child and the child is then able to respond in some way to remember it. So, yes. Yeah. Good stuff. I love that. Well, I love the fact that your teacher worked directly with your daughter. And yeah, said, right. You can, you can come up with a plan. Uh, and, and my guess is they probably were very human with her and say, yes. you know, sweetheart, I forgot stuff. And here's what I learned to do. Put a bracelet on my, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, thinking right now of Sharon. Sharon is a great mom in East Texas. Uh, that I know of and have written about. She's just a, a common sense mom. She loves her children. 
Uh, and yet Brooke, when she was, uh, I think, in middle school, you know, called her up in the middle of the day and say, Mom, I forgot my permission slip I was supposed to bring into school. Can you run it down? I'm going to get in trouble. And her mom, Sharon, said, Brooke, sweetheart, you know I love you, but you know I can't drop what I'm doing right now just because you forgot the permission slip. It was right there on the table. I signed it for you. You forgot to. And she went, Mom, I'm going to have to run laps. <laughs> And Sharon smiled and said, honey, you can use the exercise. <laughs> I thought that is a mom who is long term. Right, right. And she, it's going to be a bad day, but it's going to be a great tomorrow because you're going to do so much better through this resilient experience you're going to have to have where you're navigating this with the gym, the PE coach. So I'll stop there. But I just think it's actually possible to build resilient kids if we don't treat them like fragile people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it can be unpleasant. I like that you're saying give me a bad day. We don't always like that, right? We don't want our children to be upset. We don't want them to be angry. We, we don't want them to, you know, have that bad day. But sometimes it's important for them to have that bad day, that bad moment, that moment that they feel embarrassed or worried uh, in that sense. They forgot something and then they can figure out a way to rectify it so they don't feel that way again. So I, I really appreciate what you're saying here. You know, we know, of course, that the hearts of parents and teachers and coaches are in the right place. You know, of course they are. Every time that we are trying to help our this child, we, we know that our hearts are in the right place. Many adults check in with their children. They want them to know, you know, what they, what they're thinking and what do they want to do and what's going to make them happy. We're very big on what's going to make you happy. But when talking about preparing kids and teens for the future, you believe we often ask them the wrong questions. So what questions do you think we should be asking them? Wow. Well, um, I, I do believe that. You're absolutely right. I think that we have um, – first of all, I'm, I've got two things to say real quick. First of all, I think we've commonly asked the typical American question. Let's, let's take a teenager. Uh, you know, where do you want to go to college? What do you want to major in? Mm -hmm. What do you want to – and all those are not bad. They're not evil or wicked questions. But I think sometimes we need to be thinking about asking who questions before what questions. What kind of person do you want to be? Uh, and I think if I get the being down, my doing almost always naturally in a sequential sort of way happens. Um, last May, I visited West Point, the military academy in New York. Mm -hmm. I'm so impressed, Robin with these young men and women up there, 18 to 22 years old, that are going to be in charge of our troops in Iraq or Afghanistan or whatever. And I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, the future looks bright because of the young men and women I was around. So I had a meal with Trey. Trey was a senior this last year, about ready to graduate. And I happened to say, Trey, you're about to graduate. What are you going to do? Well, you know, What are you going to do? I asked that typical question. And he didn't. He was very respectful. But he said, well, Dr. Elmore, I need to say, I don't yet know what I want to do. Right now, I'm working on the man I want to be. Mm, gosh, I, so good. Gonna make your, that's the guy you want your daughter to marry, you know? And he said, I've got, I'm getting teary right now. I've, I've got mentors in my life right now. I'm reading books right now. And I feel like in the next few years, if I really know the kind of man I want to be, I, I know my gifts and talents, and I'll know I want to apply them in a, in a great way force for good. But I thought, Trey, you were ahead of your time. I was not thinking that way at 21 years old. So um, that would be one. I think we need to be asking our kids, that means students and children, who do you want to be? Mm -hmm. What kind of person do you want to be? Uh, with our kids, I don't know if this sounds cheesy, we would take them down to the soup kitchen or the rescue mission, and we would feed homeless people only because it gave them a feel for how some of the population lives, and it made them very much appreciative of their middle-class life. Mm -hmm. But So it made them think, I want to do good. Mm -hmm. I want to do something for someone that has less than me. So they, the being started taking shape, not just I'm on this fast track to make a lot of money and get a car and a, you know, whatever, whatever, uh, a, a mm -hmm. apartment. So that would be one. The other thing I would say, Robin, before you volley back is this. Um, I did a blog post on this very, very uh, question. I think instead of asking, what do you want out of life, which is essentially 
the American question. You know, we have the American dream, you know, what we want to do and what do you want out of life. Um, I learned after reading an incredible book years ago that that may be the wrong question. Do you remember Viktor Frankl? He went through the dark days of World War II in a concentration camp. Mm -hmm. I think he was in Auschwitz. And he was an incredible uh, psychologist who went through the war. But he basically said the prisoners of war that were in those concentration camps that died most quickly were the ones that were asking, uh, what do I want out of life? And they weren't getting it. It's, they certainly weren't getting it in the concentration camp. And so they would shrivel up and die quickly because life did not turn out the way they had wanted. Mm. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. He said he began to ask himself the question, instead of saying, what do I want out of life? I need to be asking, what is life asking of me? Mm. Now, let me tell you why this is so profound. You can answer that question in any context. So there he was in the most horrifying of places, in a Nazi concentration camp, perhaps preparing to die through a gas chamber and saying, I may have limited days, but what's life asking of me? And he suddenly began to think, it's asking me to be encouraging to these fellow prisoners. Mm -hmm. It's asking me to retain everything I'm learning because one day I do hope to get out and help others. But it was the what's life asking of me that turned his life around and enabled him to have hope to survive and actually do good. And he wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning. And it's fabulous. Mm -hmm. It's a classic. But um, I know I'm preaching now and I probably shouldn't be, but, but I'm probably preaching to the choir. This is the kind of thing we need to have our young adults begin to ask themselves when they've come of age, what's life asking of me and what can I do to be a force for good? Mm. I, I, I love listening to what you're saying. I think it's incredibly important. Um, and I, I like to actively ask children and teens questions that that challenge them and, and make them think in this profound way. I, I truly do believe that they have a, a great deal to offer. I like highlighting the strengths of kids and listening for their strengths and, and pulling those out because I think that they have so much to offer. One of the areas that you cover in your book is how our children may not respond to old teaching methods in a new world, a place where they might need to sit passively to yeah. receive information, when they would maybe respond better to active learning, where they can be creative, certainly a, a sign of this new generation. And such a situation you talk about can cause apathy. So. If you have a child, as many of us do, who seems more like a fish out of water in school, they're yeah. bored or they're misunderstood since they don't fit into this old mode uh, of, of learning, how can you, as a parent, as a coach, as an educator, how can you light that child's fire or help to light their fire and move them from apathy to passion? Well, that's a brilliant question. And I think in short, I would say the key is going to be the word metacognition. Now, that's a big 50 cent word. So let me break it down because I I'm a layman when it comes to to this. But Harvard University kind of really um, began to put this term on the map and it began to sweep the educational world by storm. Metacognition in its essence means thinking about my thinking. It's having a child do more than just respond to a quiz or an assignment or a project. And it's causing them to really own it. That's really what metacognition causes a child to own what they're doing. So instead of renting their education, they're owning their education. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you what. I discovered this on accident when I was mentoring some university students years ago. Um, and I'll tell you what happened. I was uh, leading this learning community of, of college students. And it was a leadership group, uh, extracurricular activity. And each week we would get together and talk about leadership, kind of a new new leadership topic. And one of the students emailed me one time and said, Tim, um, who's going to pick the topic for next week? And I grabbed my laptop and I typed in, I can do that. Or at least that's what I thought I typed in. My letter I on my keypad is right next to the letter U. Mm -hmm. Incidentally typed in, you can do that without even knowing. <laughs> well, I showed up the next week. I drew a breath to start leading this meeting. And these students jumped in not knowing I had not just empowered them. to. One of them did an opening activity. Another one showed a movie clip. Another one did this and that. And That's then amazing. One let it, oh, it was so, 
I never told him it was an accident. <laughs> it, because it was brilliant. <laughs> yeah. So really, and I know I'm oversimplifying if a teacher's listening, but because it's not just, hey, do it yourself. But I did let them DIY, do it yourself. So I would say if you're a parent or a teacher or a coach and you're wondering, are they not really passionate? Maybe it's because they're not owning this topic or subject enough. Mm. Coaches, maybe you let, need to let them own how practice goes next Thursday. Mm. Uh, teachers, maybe you let, need to let them own what they're doing on that project or how they're doing it. I discovered years ago students support what they help create. Mm. Student support, what they help create. So um, one of the um, NCAA Division One athletic programs we worked with years ago was the Texas Longhorn football team. Mac Brown was still the head coach, and he was having trouble getting his players to own the team that year. You know, they were just kind of showing up and doing whatever drill he gave them. So we t started talking to them about this principle, and I said, how could you practice this? And Coach Brown said, I think I'm going to put the players in charge of practice. How are we going to get ready for Texas Tech this next Saturday? And so I called up Kenny Rucker, one of the running backs coaches, and I said, how are they doing? And Kenny smiled and said, well, they're not always making brilliant decisions. Mm -hmm. But he said, you never see a student athlete own getting into the end zone as when they get to come up with how it happens. Mm -hmm. And I thought, brilliant. It's messier. But boy, isn't ownership what we want. So I don't know if I've done a good job or I've done justice on this, but I think passion comes when a student gets to not only choose the subject they're learning, but how they get to a, approach it, with the project they get to build, or how they get to do it. I, I just think the more they get to create it, the more they, they really own it. You're, you're making something percolate in my head because I, when I was a doctoral student, my very first year of my doctoral uh, career, my uh, one of my teachers in cognitive psychology had us do something called a meta hobby, which was for us to learn how we learn. And it was a six week project that uh, we had got to pick anything we wanted, but we needed to document all the thing, all the different parts, what we were feeling, what we were thinking, what worked for us, what didn't work for us. And it was really an understanding of when you yeah. got to that aha moment. And I did yoga, and it was I just still remember yeah. that one moment yeah. where I something clicked, and I went, "Oh yes!" And all that yeah. understanding of learning how you learn, and and yes. realizing that you can, you don't have to sit there passively. That you can find a way to make this work for you. But I'm going to challenge you right here because I want to know, I want to flip this a little bit. Okay. I want right. you to imagine that you're sitting with a young person. They're known to be smart, but yeah. they haven't really worked to what is thought of as their potential in school. The child yeah. has sort of maybe played some sports, but yeah. his, or her, his, his or her parents' frustration hasn't really stuck with anything, maybe due to a lack of love for the traditional stuff their friends are inter interested in. Teachers are getting frustrated with the child because they know that this child is smart, but they don't seem to apply themselves. And they, maybe they're disruptive in school. Perhaps they've even been uh, diagnosed or medicated for ADHD, but they just seem to be sort of coasting through life, not they're kind of apathetic, not finding their thing. And that child winds up either getting frustrated, that they're, they're getting frustrated, the child's getting overlooked. So now what do you say to the child to help that child change something around, help them to go towards leading and succeeding in their life? Well, it's a great question, and I don't know if there's one right answer uh, on this, but I will share a story that I think illustrates it. So up in Massachusetts, there is a high school, uh, just a regular public school, and uh, one of the kids, one of the high school kids came home from school, and his mom asked the typical question, uh, how was school today? And he said, boring. Mm -hmm. Yep, right, sure. You know, that sort of thing. Yep. And uh, so she said, well, why was it boring? She goes, well, mom, the teachers just lecture and I don't really, you know, like it and blah, 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 blah. And she kind of off the cuff said, well, why don't you start your own school? And she was kind of making a joke. But this high school student took her up on it. He went into um, this same week, but a, a few days later, went in and sat down and talked to his principal and said, I'd like to start what became called as the independent project. And what it was, was it was a portion of the school day once a week that the students could do whatever they wanted. 
Now, it had to be a project. It couldn't just go off and play video games. But whether it was culinary arts or chemistry related or whatever, writing, writing a book. But the, a handful of students, a beta test, a group of students started doing this and they fully engaged. In fact, Robin, they so engaged, it made them engage in the rest of the subjects in their day because they had to learn some of the other things to do that project. Like they had to engage with language arts to write what they wanted to write. That's amazing. I really like hearing that. And uh, it's great to hear that this child has uh, sort of took took the whole project under her wing and said, this is what I'm going to do. That's really amazing. Yeah, yeah it really was. So I guess um, the takeaway for that is, again, it goes back to the idea of ownership. Even if you give them a portion of their time after school, if it has to be, where they really own something and it's no adult prescribing every step. We lead descriptively, not prescriptive. Describe a goal together and let them go after, not prescribe every step, which we tend to do. Mm -hmm. I think that makes the difference. I really mm -hmm. do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Really interesting. And, you know, so many of us have have that child who, you know, we feel like they just still haven't found their groove yet. They haven't found their thing yet. And sometimes it's that we're, you know, putting them in a situation that, kind of stunts their growth a bit because it's just not lighting their fire as is, yeah. but then they need to kind of find a way to get around that. And, yes. uh, you yeah. know, what, what is it that's going to light your fire? Yeah. You know, what, yeah. what, what does light your fire? Is there any situation that you're in that you've said, wow, this is incredibly interesting to me because if you're thinking that, you know, maybe that would be something that somebody else would also be interested in doing and you can kind of build on that together. So it's, it's an interesting idea that, that this one person was able yeah. to, you know, look at something in a different way and then other yeah. people responded so favorably to it. It's great. Yeah, it was awesome. Yeah. So you do a lot of activities with young people to help them, as you say, march off the map and become a pioneer in the new world. So for the parents, teachers, and coaches listening, what is one activity that you would suggest we do with kids today to help them navigate and lead in this new world? Wow. Great question. Um, a couple of thoughts come to my mind. One is, I, I think it would be to look at their lives as a caring adult, whether you're a parent, coach, teacher, whatever, and see areas that you perceive they need to grow in. And, and out of belief, you know they can grow in that area. And then maybe design an activity around that. Mm -hmm. For instance, in our home, we were noticing that our kids were getting very good at screens, video games and... <laughs> What I'm saying, it just happens. And yes. we're noticing that their interpersonal skills were not quite as strong. Mm -hmm. So one muscle's getting developed, the other muscle's atrophying. You know what I'm saying? Right. And they're going to need it when they graduate from school and, and go from backpack to briefcase. So um, we started a dinnertime conversation about this topic that did not necessarily go over well. Even though I try to be a very winsome communicator, Dad's talk was just not really <laughs> too potent. So here's what we decided to do. My wife and I decided to have some parties at our house for our adult friends. And we had our children host the parties. Neat. Now, so instead of an, a lecture on emotional intelligence or interpersonal skills, we had our 8-year-old and 12-year-old, so they're young mm -hmm. now, host the parties. Well, at first they went, oh, my gosh, this is so stupid to do this. <laughs> but eventually, Robin... I mean, we saw them answering the door. Hi, Mr. Johnson. Come on in. Have you met Mrs. Smith? Could I take your coat? Would you like an iced tea? What would you like to drink? And we saw them hosting. Now, we prompted them, but after that, it was up to them. We were with our friends talking. So the 8 and 12-year-old were doing this. Afterwards then, so it was driven by an experience, we had the greatest conversation about EQ. Mm. In fact, it was so funny because our daughter Bethany went, oh, my gosh, Mr. Johnson's EQ is so low. And I went, oh, my <laughs> Bethany, look in the mirror, you know, but it was just cute because, you know, this experiences drive the best conversations, mm -hmm. not lectures. Mm -hmm. So I guess what I'm saying is we started creating experiences and environments that drove to great reflection and principles, you know, that they needed to learn. Like, how do you listen? 
We, we, you know, you look them in the eye and you find one common uh, piece that, that they just said. So I would say creating experiences and environments that you know they need to grow in, but instead of the lecture or the talk that you have, talk number 53, you have an experience. I'll, I'll tell you a great one. I just was at Ole Miss working with her athletic department, with her student athletes, and I talked to the coaches first. And, I, and, and their big theme this year at Ole Miss is find your why. Mm-hmm. So the athletes were supposed to, do I play golf just because I love golf or is there a bigger reason? Well, it might be academics. It might be something else. So, Robin, you'd be so proud of these young men and women. All I recommended to the coaches, I said, sometime before the end of this season, take them out to a graveyard. And they went, what? <laughs> <laughs> that, that's, I'm still in that state. What? <laughs> And I said, in fact, make it as old as you can. You know, one of those old 19th century graveyards that are in the South quite Mm -hmm. a bit. And I said, have them just walk through the graveyard and read the tombstones for about 15 minutes in silence. Well, if you remember, those old tombstones would have names and dates, and then they often had a sentence about the person. Uh, You know, Molly Thatcher was a wonderful mother, blah, 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 blah. So they walk through the, uh, they, they walk, I, I encourage them to do this. The golf team did it right away. They walked through the graveyard and then afterwards they talked about what they'd read. And of course they noticed what you would expect. Some people lived a long time. Some people not so much. Some had a really nice thing written about them. Others not so much. But then they begin to talk about their sentence. What would be said about them mm-hmm. when they finished life? Well, I'm telling you, I did this with my son and daughter when they were 12. You have some of the most amazing conversations because, number one, you're in a graveyard. It's very sobering, you know. Right. Some people get emotional. I've had college students get cry because they remember grandmother or grandfather. But, boy, do they start coming up with brilliant statements that are way more about what level they got on in Grand Theft Auto, you know, or whatever. Sure. It was was more about, man, I want to say something great, you know. And I'm, I'm getting emotional again. But. This kind of activity, this kind of experience leads to great conversations. Um, so, uh, And by the way, on our website, we have a free resource called 52 Leadership Ideas you can use with students. It's little projects like this if you're a mom or dad or coach, and that's helpful. Feel free to go there just to get sparkers for, for such experiences. Awesome, awesome. Those were so interesting, and I love the idea of you know, the legacy that you want to leave and, and to be able to sum up you know, what is the impact that you want to make on this world so that these kids are, are constantly driving towards that. Can you give us your top tip? What is your very top tip that you want to leave everybody with to help them motivate and inspire a young person to lead and succeed? Okay, great question. Um, The first thought that just raced in my mind was this. I am seeing a pattern in, in adults, and it's understandable, but here's the pattern. We try to encourage and affirm and encourage and affirm, encourage and affirm, but we're seeing this generation gap between where we are and where they are, and it's getting wider all the time. And and so when we finally get frustrated enough, we just vent. You know, we just, out of frustration, we just critique them or even attack them. We don't mean to, but we yell, we we, we get mad, and sure. I, everybody listening would say, yep, I, I did that, yep. you know, as recent as last week. Absolutely. So the thought, the thought that I have come to with my own life is this. I will either be a surgeon or a vampire when I give feedback to a child. Yes, I know. That's quite, quite uh, extreme here. Um, we teach with images here at Growing Leaders. So images are, well, habitudes. We call them habitudes. Habitudes are images that form leadership habits and attitudes. So when I give feedback, I'm either going to just – let it store up, and, and, and finally I just vent. Like, By the way, like a vampire, I sneak up on them, and I draw blood, not literally, but figuratively speaking, and they're worse afterwards. Mm. Or I'm a surgeon. It's a well-lit room. We planned this encounter, We ta- and I only surgically remove that tumor. I don't slice up your body. I don't talk about everything that's wrong with the warts and pimples. and <laughs> I just take that one tumor out. And so to be a surgeon rather than a vampire, here's the takeaway. I've got to speak out of belief, not relief. Mm. I so often speak out of relief. I want to relieve the tension. I want mm. to relieve 
frustration. I want to vent and get it off my chest, quote unquote. I've got to think if I truly believe in this young guy or young gal, I've got to speak. Sweetheart, I believe in you. And I know you can do this geometry. I know you can. Mm-hmm. I've seen you hard things before. And if we'll speak that way, somehow I just think they respond, even if it's still hard, it's not like they're going to love it right mm-hmm. away. They go, somebody actually believes I can do this. And you and I both know, we've yes. studied enough about the human psychology that believe, what belief does to a person. Um, it just, it's just crazy. One last illustration. Um, when experiments have been done on teachers giving feedback to students, all kinds of options were tested. But the one comment that got the best effort after it was given was this. And here were the words that the teacher wrote down on a post-it note. I'm giving you these comments because I have high expectations of you. And I know you can reach them. Suddenly, all this hard feedback that they were going to, you know, the red ink they were going to look at on that paper um, suddenly became, oh, she thinks I can do it. Yes. So I'll- It's beautiful. No, it's a really important uh, statement. And obviously, we can all do that. And, uh, you know, it it makes a very impact, big impact on kids about how we react. It's not always easy, but we can do it. And it does, you know, these are the words that they carry with them. They become the scripts in their heads. So if we say it, they will adopt it. Why don't you give us the resource of the week? Where can people go to get more information about you, to get this 52 leadership uh, ideas that you talked about? Where can we go to get your books? And uh, what website should we go to? Okay. The simplest one would be the website for Growing Leaders. And it's real simple. It's simply growingleaders.com, growingleaders.com. And it has lots of free resources and certainly the books you have mentioned, Robin. Thanks for bringing those up. We just we want to be a resource, as you do, to moms, dads, teachers, coaches, employers who are really responsible for developing this next generation who are going to be leading us in 20 years. So that's what we're all about. Absolutely. Growing. Absolutely. Your Growing Leaders um, program and the books that you provide, they are so useful and they do expand on what we've talked about today. I really am so thankful that you've been here and talked to us today. I loved what you said about belief, not relief, and um, experiencing uh, is what drives the learning and that children support what they can create. All of these ideas are things that we can do in our classrooms, in our homes, on the sports fields, in our uh, after-school activities. And so thank you so much for coming on and talking to us about growing leaders. Thank you so much, Dr. Elmore. Robin, you're a great hostess. Thanks for having me on. It was an honor. You're welcome. Well, I've got my takeaways and sweet friends. I know you have yours. Let's discuss them. Come up on Facebook. Let's go to the Dr. Robin Silverman page or let's chat about it at drrobinsilverman.com or twitter.com slash Dr. Robin. I'm going to be going back and forth with Dr. Elmore, creating memes. We'll be putting them on Instagram. We'll be sharing them all over the place because as you know, we've gotten some great quotes from Dr. Elmore today and we certainly want to share those. And if you love this podcast like I did, I hope you'll go up to iTunes and rate and review it so other people can learn about Dr. Elmore and all that he is putting out into the world to help it make it a better place for kids. I truly appreciate it. That's all the time we have for today. My fellow parents, leaders, and educators, thank you so much for tuning in to How to Talk to Kids About Anything. For more information on books, articles, speaking engagements, or curriculum, please visit drrobinsilverman.com. So many great podcasts up there. Show notes up there uh, are up there as well, as well as the podcast information, and of course, the websites that we were talking about today and the books. I look forward to weathering the storms and enjoying the sunny side of life together. And please remember, even on the days when you fall short, I know you're listening to this and saying, whoops, I did that, I did that, oops, I forgot to do this. That's okay. You're here. You're getting the information you need. I know it's not easy, but never forget there's always tomorrow. Parenting is the ultimate do-over. I see you. I'm right there with you. And as there are moments when we doubt our know-how, our choices, and our sweet sanity, please know you're 10 times the parent you think you are. Until next time, this is Dr. Robin Silverman with How to Talk to Kids About Anything. Please tune in again and keep connecting through conversation. See you next week. 
been listening to How to Talk to Kids About Anything with Dr. Robin Silverman. For more information on books, articles, speaking engagements, or curriculum, please visit drrobinsilverman.com.